Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, on February 14th, the world was shaken once again by a deadly mass shooting at a school. 17 students and staff members at Stoneman Douglas High School were killed and 17 more injured. The difference this time was in the wake of the shooting, a movement was born. The students of Stoneman Douglas would not let this pass, and they created the March for Our Lives campaign, quite possibly the loudest and most persuasive battle for gun control this country has ever seen. Our next guest, Cameron Kasky, is one of those students, and after fighting the right for almost a year, he's searching for middle ground, and he's here to talk to us about it. Please welcome Cameron Kasky. I should rephrase what I said, too, there. I don't know if I was clear enough. It was uh, 17 students and staff members that were killed, and, and even more than that, I believe, were, were, were injured. Were injured, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Cameron, um, before we get into really what the last year or so of your life has been like, uh, let's just get right into what middle ground is. Talk to me about what middle ground is. Well, one of the biggest problems I'm seeing in our political discourse right now is the fact that people are not interested in engaging folks who disagree with them. And it's difficult, it really is. I'm sure everybody in this room has that one family member that's why we can't talk about politics at Thanksgiving. You know, when they're coming, maybe we need to cool off about that and focus on movies. But, um... Well, even harder for me. <laughs> well, conversations are, are, especially about difficult topics, are not easy. It's, it's difficult to look at somebody who fundamentally disagrees with you about something that could truly affect somebody's life and understand their perspective. And that was an issue I faced. I thought that folks who disagreed with me on gun control didn't care when kids died. And I thought that, you know, there are people who are pro-life who think that people who are pro-choice want to kill babies. And people who are pro-choice that think people who are pro-life want to oppress women. I mean, we all attack each other's worst arguments. We all assume that everybody is malicious. I mean, I'd say 96% of the country cares when kids get shot. There's a 4% margin that shrugs it off. But a lot of people in this country care and we all want the, the country and the world to be a safer, better place. The question is, how do we approach it? When you talk about middle ground, I mean, and you poll most of the country when it comes to gun control laws, the majority of the country, according to polling, is for background checks, is actually for, I believe, uh, bump stock bans and, and, automa and automatic weapons bans, for the most part, when it comes to polling. That's middle ground, right? I think that, I think that in, in, in a way it is. Um, the important thing to focus on here is the fact that what we're do what, so much of what we're seeing is ad hominem attacks. If somebody wants to criticize the things I've said, and I've said some things that are easily oh, that I'm very, about which I'm very open to criticism, they should be attacking my argu arguments, not me. All right, you don't need to talk about whether or not I turned in a good performance in Fiddler on the Roof when you're talking about policy, because I didn't, and that's beside the point. And um, don't laugh beloved, at me. A beloved performance. I'm still I'm still ashamed of that. You guys are. Um, but, you know, it's right now, everybody, a lot of people are pretending that they want to engage. A lot of people are saying, oh, yeah, you know, if somebody wants to open a conversation with me, I'm happy to speak to them. And then, you know, I sit down with somebody who disagrees with them, and they think that I'm instantly turning to the dark side. It's, it, we're at a time in our discourse where we have a very crucial decision to make. Do we want to find solutions as a country, or do we want to continue to sling mud at each other? And, you know, with the first, uh, with the first wave of Gen Z coming into adulthood, I mean, if, if, if what I'm at right now is what you would consider adulthood, we, we're at a point where we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, do we want to move forward or, we, or do we want to move farther apart? Now, whenever it comes to activism and change has to be made, I always think it's important for the activists to push as hard as, as possible. There, at a certain point, there can be no middle ground when you're trying to affect change. When the change starts to happen, you can come back and you can find middle ground, but you just have to push. Sure. Well, You've been pushing for almost a year now. When did you realize that you had to start looking for common ground? So this summer, I was in Texas. And, you know, I met those families that have semi-automatic weapons that I would instantly want to ban to protect their families. These are not people who want to hurt anybody. These are not people who think that these weapons are, are ne a, ne a truly negative impact in our country. And I looked at them, and this is a family. This is a, a husband, a wife, and two kids who just you know, go home every night and want the world to be a safer place, w want to do everything they can to protect people, but they look at it differently than I do. And, um, did they change your mind on, on Well, no, I'm not asking people to, no, they did not change my mind, but I'm not asking people to change their minds. All right, we're not, we're not here to change how we look at, we're not here to change our beliefs, we're here to change how we approach them. I could still just as adamantly believe in my gun control policies if I talk to somebody who disagrees with me on them. 
But the only difference is out of that comes an understanding, and an understanding is what we're lacking so deeply right now. Do you see um, a lack of civility? Because I think what we're kind of talking about here, if we're not changing minds, is, is discourse and a civilized discourse about a difference of opinions. Do you see that lack of civility being flung from both sides? Yes, very much so. And, and it comes in different forms. What I've seen is there are a lot of young liberals who will, who will flail their arms and try to use emotional attacks. There are a lot of young conservatives who are only focused on owning the libs. And it's just everybody goes into these arguments not wanting to come out with a better understanding of each other, but wanting to come out having owned the other, the having wanted to embarrass the other. We, we, have, no, we have no real objectives here. We just want to hurt each other. Yeah, not physically, of course, but r r civil discourse. A lot of things right now are being... Are, pretending to be civil discourse. It's a bad faith argument on the part of one party or one side in this, uh, a lot of the times that says this is an uncivil discourse and oftentimes that what is uncivil to them is just maybe pointing out the fact that something that they are arguing for is uh, hurtful. Exactly, look, I'm 17 years old. I was frequently propped up as an expert. Okay, trust me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna endow my trust in this audience. Trust me, I am not the expert on anything. Some comic books I'm really good with. I can tell you everything that's happened. But other than that, you cannot call me the expert on anything. So what I want to do right now is learn. And I think that the most important way to learn is to learn from people who you might not necessarily want to learn from. Because at the end of the day, all it will do is strengthen your beliefs. If I speak to somebody who disagrees with me on gun control and we, and we have that discussion, and I, I walk out of it with my beliefs, they're only stronger because I understand the other side. Again, I said it before. The right and the left will attack each other's worst possible arguments. When, when I was, if, I was at, if I was debating somebody on guns uh, earlier this year, I would say, oh, great, so you want everybody to have a gun. And they'd say, oh, great, so you want to take all our guns. And we're not making any progress. We're just trying to, we're just trying to, there's, there's no real objective. One up each other. Exactly. I don't Win that argument. There's no, there's no conversation with, uh, with, for, the, for the purpose of a uh, long distance game. It's just about winning that moment. Exactly. And you know, I think Gen Z, as we grow up a bit, I think we can really do something about that. Because I think that our generation is very invested in principles. I mean, I also think that our generation, because of social media, is headed down a semi-dark path with, of egomania and obsession with how others view us. But I see uh, a majority of bright things with us. I think that Gen Z is ready to invest in working together. I think that Gen Z, with the right push, because you need a push. This is not easy. Engaging people you disagree with is not easy. But with the right push, we can, we can you know, understand each other and stop it with these silly ad hominem straw man attacks that you so often see. Well, Gen Z came up in a time where things have gotten drastically bad. They've been kicked, the can has been kicked down the road for so long, for generations prior to this, like me, that you guys came up at a time where there's, no, there's nowhere else for the can to go. It's just been kicked too far. And you know what? We need to fill it back up with water. We, sorry. No, that's good. I'm, we'll I'm a health this. guy. We're not, no soda, no alcohol, water. Just water. Yes, we're going to fill up the can with water. And uh, I don't know where I was going with that. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, you know, uh, after the, after the shooting, um, you and, uh, and, and David and a number of other students in, you know, built the, built this movement. Did you know that you were building a movement? When did you start to realize that you could actually impact some change? And do you feel like you have? Well, there's certainly been some change in at least the conversation around guns and how we approach it. But you know the the whole the whole point behind starting the Never Again and March for Our Lives movement was we had seen these school shootings before. I mean, I was born in 2000. I kind of you know these are these have kind of been a staple of my childhood is turning on the news and seeing a mass shooting somewhere, and we we had seen these shootings before where the news would come in, film a bunch of people crying, take some panning shots of how it was just a nice town, talk about how the shooter was just a nice troubled boy, you know didn't he he meant better than that and. And what we didn't, uh, and it, it, was, it sucked because I was sitting there thinking, Parkland's about to be that city where people hear it and they think of folks crying. People hear the word Parkland and the room gets silent and the room gets somber. Like and Andy Hook or like Littleton, Colorado. or Like all, like all these places. And I wanted people to, to hear the word Parkland and think this is the city where people stood up and said no. 
This is the city where the, the cameras came, and instead of people crying in front of them, people went in front of them and said, we need a change. Now, no matter what the change was, and I believe, I believe that the change needed to come from stronger gun legislation, no matter what the change was, I wanted people to remember my city as the city that stood up instead of stepped back. And there's, there was really no precedent. I mean, there's beginning to become a precedent. I mean, everybody in this room, you've seen enough school shootings that you're kind of starting to see a pattern with all this, and that's disgusting. But, um, but we, we didn't know what to do. And as to when we knew it was going to be a movement, I can't tell you because the, the whole thing feels like it happened in just a minute, but also over the past 20 years. I mean, I can't tell you how long I've been 17 years old. It's ridiculous. You, you mean that it's, it feels like it's been a long time? It feels like it's been a very long time, yes. Why do you think that is? Because the, over the past seven months, we've been organizing a nationwide movement to prevent for mass shootings after mass shooting. That, that really, that, that, you learn a lot of lessons, and you develop a lot of principles. And I started to look at things different ways, um, just on a personal level, not on really a policy level, but you know, with myself. I, learned, I, I goofed a lot. I made some hard mistakes. What do, you, what, do, what do you think a mistake that you made was? I think that a lot of my rhetoric was, a lot of my personal rhetoric, not the, necessarily the rhetoric of the people I worked with, but a lot of my personal rhetoric was aimed more at, at turning some people against other people as opposed to uniting everybody. I feel, I feel like I was focused more on making the, the people who were defending all these gun laws look bad as opposed to figuring out how, where we can all get something done. And that's fine. What, how am I supposed to know any better, dude? I'm a drama kid. Like yeah, I, also, the, I the, day the day of the shooting, I was at rehearsal. And then, and then I go to pick up my little brother, and suddenly the world changes. So I, I, I don't, I'm not kicking myself for it. And I, I encourage anybody else who, is, who has made mistakes ever since not to kick themselves for it. Because what, what are we supposed to know? You know? I, I also don't think that... You know, the rhetoric that you may be embarrassed about or uh, ashamed of was necessarily your fault, not to say a, a kind of chicken or the egg argument, but I mean, very quickly, as soon as you and, and everybody sort of rose up and said enough is enough, you were attacked viciously sure. by members of the conservative media. People who are adults who are supposed to be voices of reason that we listen to. I'm not talking about just Twitter eggs. Well, I'm talking about people on the news. Sure. Well, you know, I'm not embarrassed and I'm not ashamed, but I'm certainly looking back at this and I'm saying, I could have done something better here. And that's fine because all I'm doing is learning and all I'm doing is developing these principles that I'm going to apply in the future. And I'm, I'm proud of that. But, um, you, you know, but I understand there were people attacking us. I understand that there was this ad hominem crap that was disgusting. People, people telling my friends that they should have been the ones who got shot. People, people photoshopping my brother's face onto the shooter's face, saying that my brother looks like the shooter, uh, which happened. But that doesn't mean I don't owe it to everybody else to be better. And again, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child. Like, I, if I can't rent a car, I don't think I should be judging myself for my political arguments. But I also think that in hindsight, I learned a lesson. And I think it's an important one, and I can only hope that my efforts, um, as I discuss more conversations between people, I can only hope that I prevent others from making the mistakes I made. Because if I stop one person from going into an argument just trying to make the other person look bad, I'll have done something right. I, I, I took a lesson, I applied it, and I feel like not enough young people are focusing on how little we know. I mean, we all, I have so much to learn, we all have so much to learn, no matter how old you are. We don't need to feel like we're... Woo, the experts, all right? We're people, and we have insight, and that insight's valuable. But um, it, we need to approach things very differently. Do you ever feel hopeless about, uh, about finding middle ground? That we've reached a point with this current administration and where we are in the discourse that we're too far beyond? Absolutely not. I'm, um, I lean to the left on a lot of my policies, but I have some very, very dear friends who lean to the right. And we get along because we like each other as people. And we can see past these political arguments. We can see past these constitutional-based arguments because we're, we're human beings, okay? If, you sit, if, if anybody in this room sits down at a, at a movie with somebody that completely disagrees with them politically in every way, and at the end of the movie you're talking about how great the movie is, and then you leave, you're not going to know that you would have otherwise hated them. You know, I, I could sit next to somebody who wants everybody to have a gun, and at the end of the day, if we both thought that Infinity War was incredibly powerful and well done, 
we both thought Infinity War was incredibly powerful and well done, which it was. It really was. <laughs> well, that's the, that, that's the one that got you guys. Weird audience. Yeah, congrats, Marvel. Yeah. You've, got, you've got us all. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the no, I, we've come to the point with Marvel. You're right. I mean, if Infinity War is the middle ground. No, we've come to a point with Marvel where they can take a two-hour shot of an acorn that only sort of moves, and I would pay $200 to see it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I am at their mercy at this point. Is there is politics in the future for you? I think politics is in the future for everybody because it affects all of our lives. Whether or not getting directly involved with it is in the future is kind of up to... Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I know that I can only hope that somebody better than me is going to be in office by the time I grow up. And if I see somebody better than I am, if I see somebody who's more principled and more willing to dedicate themselves to the American people, I'll say, great, congratulations. But I also know that I have a drive inside me to make sure that the people around me and the people in this country that I truly cannot understand the struggles of have better lives. So we'll just have to see. I also like other things. <laughs> I like stuff that wasn't politics before we were thrust into this. What have you learned this past year about the political process and about activism? I've learned that it's, um, it's, it's not black and white. It's really gray. I've met some people on both sides who are fantastic. I've met some people on both sides who have monetary and political gains and, and are manipulative. But um, I've, I've also learned just a different type of empathy for my fellow human being. And I've learned that I'm not, I don't know everything. I mean, I was a 17-year-old boy. I was an entitled, privileged 17-year-old boy. I thought, I thought I had all the answers. I thought the world should have been lining up at my door to hear what I had to say. And then I realized, <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Before or after? I'm sorry, you mean like while? Well, during, yes, during after everything. The, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think we all need to look at each other in a different way. I think we all need to realize that we're all people. I mean, for God's sake, we're all people. If somebody comes up to me and, and starts... Be, I've, I've used a similar you know, example before, but if somebody starts beating up the person next to me, I'm going to defend the person next to me, even if I don't know what their political views are. We're all human beings. We need to start focusing on that more. And it's hard. It's very, very difficult because so often principles and ethics get bleed into our policy. That's how it works. Policy affects human lives. But we have to, we have to remember that many of us have the same goal. What do you think that goal is? A better life for everybody in the world. You said that you learned, you had a lot of lessons that you learned um, this past year uh, in your role as an activist. You know, I was listening to an interview with Barack Obama recently, and he said that one of the things that we forget as citizens is that better is good. We always focus on utopia. We always focus on everything being done and fixed, and it rarely is that way. But better is good, and we should focus more on making things just better incrementally. Do you feel like you, you accomplished that? I feel like... The greatest, I feel like the, the two greatest things that have been accomplished are, number one, when people hear Parkland, they don't think of tears. They think of people standing up. And number two, the conversation changed. There's, well, there was a new attention brought to a situation that is incredibly important, and it is a situation we must address, we must address no matter how we address it. Because I, the, the, I understand why people thought we didn't have to do anything after Columbine. Because Columbine was supposed to be an anomaly, Right? Everybody here who was alive for Columbine, it was supposed to be, uh, everybody was shocked. Everybody said, how could this one time thing happen? But then they stacked up and they continued. And more and more Americans lost their lives on, and, 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 uh, on our soil. And, and we were too many, we lost too many good people. And we've lost too many good people for all the wrong reasons for us not to do something right now. What has going back to school been like? I'm finishing online. Yeah, that was always my plan. I can't sit in a classroom. Look at me right now. I'm moving a lot. I, that's not for me. But I, my younger brother has returned to school. And, I mean, he's living his life. You know, he's he, the best. Here, here's what I said. Uh, to everybody at my school who, who didn't take the path I did and, and continue to live their lives, I got confused. I said, how could you do this? With all the change that needs to be made, how could you go back to your practices? How could you go back to your rehearsals? How could you continue playing video games with your friends? And there was a vindictive rage inside me. And then I realized, these peop what these people are doing is they're, they're winning. The shooter came into the school wanting to ruin everything. The shooter wanted to ruin everybody's lives and make the world the terrible, dark place 
that they wanted to make it. And when people continued their lives and said, you know what, no matter what you did, I'm going to smile. I'm going to love people. I'm going to continue to put the love into the world that you took out when you killed all those people. That was, that was those people winning. That was those people showing the shooter that no matter what they do, they can't take love out of the world and they can't take love away from these people. And, and, I'm, and I, I learned just how important it is to, after such a horrible thing, live your life. Because no matter what, the sun, shi- the sun will rise the next morning. The world will spin on. And even though it feels like everything's going to, nothing's ever going to get better. And it will take time. There's, there's, there's still love in the world. There's still hope. And there's still a way that we can bring back the love that we lost. I know it's not Infinity War, but let's give him a round of applause for that. You have no reason to believe it's not Infinity War. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Right here. Hi. Um, so I'm from Boca, which is 40 minutes well, from Parkland. 40? Yeah. A bad like traffic. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so when I was watching the news on that day, I completely, you know, felt the emotions you were feeling because I was so close to you and I was terrified as well. Um, so I, I know that there's been a drastic change in my school and we're so close to you. And I just wanted to know, like, what's been the most drastic change, not only in your school, but like in your life, uh, in this, in these past seven months? First of all, where are you, River? Uh, no, Bogai. Okay, cool. I have some friends there. We'll talk after. Um... <laughs> I think the most drastic change is that a lot of people I know, and this this answers both for my life and the school, a lot of people I know kind of realized how stupid our petulant little squabbles are. And you know, you how you might hate somebody and talk and you know be talking crap about them all day because you never know when it could all be over. And um and we, I think we all have to reassess what gets us upset at each other. I mean you know, whether or not your friend liked your, your Instagram picture, it, it all becomes nothing once you lose somebody. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I, I feel like in addition to the epidemic of mass shootings that we have, we also have an epidemic of uh, unarmed black men being shot by police officers. And I'm wondering, I feel like that should be included in our conversations about gun control. And I'm wondering how you think that we should include that conversation in this. I country. think the most important thing we could do for communities where unarmed people are being shot, particularly unarmed black men, are provide police officers that are from that community. I've been to a lot of neighborhoods this summer that dealt with that struggle. And the one thing I was hearing from everybody in those communities are these police officers that we're, that we're dealing with, they, they aren't from where I'm from. And, you know, generally speaking, if I'm, if I, no matter where I am, and if there's somebody policing my neighborhood, I want that person to know my neighborhood. I want to see a police officer, and I want them to grow up the way I grew up and, and know my community. So I think a great thing we could do for these communities is train police officers that, that grew up there. Train a police officer that can go into the corner store and, and have gone to that corner store their entire life, who can understand the struggles that young people in that community deal with, because they've been there before. I think we need to... I think we need to invest time into helping these communities through more than just policing because policing isn't going to solve everything. A lot of people will say that. It won't. Um, we, we, need to, we need to fix it. We also don't need to be like Rahm Emanuel and dump $95 million into a police training academy while defunding a lot of public programs. So that's not going to bring us anywhere either. But um, I think no matter what, no matter where, no matter who is in the community, a community should be policed by people who understand the struggles of that community. Do you have time for one more right here? Hi, Cameron. How are you? Hey. Thanks for being here. So you mentioned that your generation, Gen Z, is invested in coming together and working together, and they're very much invested in principles. Forward thinking, we're in a big year, in a midterm election year, um, and a lot of the Parkland kids are seen as uh, the progressive voice, especially in Florida. Um, How are you mobilizing across all sides of the argument, especially around gun control, for your generation to be involved in this election year? Well, I mean, if you if you look at the efforts from the students at March for Lives and, and the students at many other similar organizations, this is a big year where everybody's going out there and saying, vote. Uh, this is, this, the, I mean, these midterms, whether or not we all like it, are, from, at least for, for me, the most important of my lifetime. Um, I'm sure there are several people in this room who have seen more important elections, but in, since 2000, I believe that this year has the most important election overall. And I think the best way to make sure people get out there and vote is to remind them just what's on the line here. 
remind them what they're voting for. Nobody wants to go out and wait in a line, especially not in Florida, which is just a, a sauna. Nobody wants to go out there and wait in a line and, and vote unless they remember that what that 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 everybody has something they're passionate about because everybody does. So people need the messaging. I believe should be what are you voting for and why are you voting this year? Because I think that's the best way to get somebody to remember to actually go out there and cast their ballot. Do you feel like you're seeing a lot of people register? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, clap. Uh, do you feel like you're seeing a lot of people register? A lot more kids? I, I, I hope that this year has the greatest turnout in history. I'll tell you that. Because the last midterm elections had the lowest turnout since World War II. Um, which is just... What? That doesn't make any sense. The population is... going. We, we have a lot of steps to take, and I think a lot of people this year are going to show up at the polls because I think a lot of, this pe a lot of people this year realize that this election, we are voting on a lot of things. Absolutely. Cameron, how can people look in the middle ground? They can talk to somebody next to them. They can, you know, they could take that Facebook friend who you unfriended during the 2016 election, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, and message them and say, hey, let's... Let's figure something out. We've all unfriended people because of an election. Let's not lie to ourselves. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's build bridges and stop breaking them. Absolutely. Cameron Kasky, everybody, let's hear it.